Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to everyone tuning in for our virtual event on transatlantic approaches to trade and climate change. It's a real honor to be joined today by my close friend and colleague, Ilaria Mazoko, who is a senior fellow with the trustee chair uh, in Chinese business and economics here at CSIS. The purpose of today's event is to discuss what did and didn't happen in 2023 at the nexus of trade and climate to really take stock of where things stand and where we might be able to deepen cooperation. It's such a pleasure to have Alaria here because she is all things uh, China focused and how China fits in to, of course, our domestic approach to using trade as a tool for combating climate change, but also how it figures into broader geopolitical uh, discussions at exactly this nexus. Another reason that we're here today is that I have recently published two briefs, which followed uh, another brief by Ilaria in December on this topic. Um, so I will go through a couple of our key findings from our report, after which I will invite Ilaria to respond, disagree, or enhance uh, anything that I have said. Um, we will not be taking questions during this event, but if you do have questions or feedback, please feel free to reach out. Uh, our email addresses are on our website. So one observation is that 2023 was supposed to be this grand green marketplace year. Uh, the European Commission and United States were negotiating a critical minerals agreement that would have afforded the European Union uh, greater access to green funds under the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which seeks in part to cut out China from uh, our critical mineral supply chains. There also was supposed to have been a major agreement called the Global Arrangement on Sustainable Steel and Aluminum, GASA here in the United States or the GSA in Europe, uh, which sought to do three primary things. Uh, combat Chinese overcapacity of carbon intensive steel and aluminum, uh, remove the Trump era tariffs on a close ally, and then in so doing incentivize deeper trade of green commodities. Uh, leaders from the EU and US convened here in DC on October 20th for what was supposed to be a series of announcements about the conclusion or serious progress within these negotiations and of course other talks um, on carbon accounting, for example. However, October 20th came and went. I think the only real concrete outcome of that meeting was actually the announcement by China at the time to apply export restrictions on graphite, which cuts at the very heart of uh, transatlantic green climate ambitions. So here we are. The question is, where do we go and what accounts for the lack of uh, progress in 2023? So I've identified in this report, which again is available on our website, uh, a couple of key differences that make the U.S. approach to climate really stand out from its allies. The first is that in the United States, there is a current theme that regards China as primarily a threat and not a customer. This is very different, of course, than the Germanys of the world, which continue to see China as primarily a customer, a market for exports with which they cannot survive, especially in the green transition. Another key difference that's, uh, I think, in some ways very responsible for stalling progress in transatlantic climate and trade discussions is that the U.S. lags significantly behind the European Union in its ability to gather data about the emissions intensity of its production. The EU, of course, has the emissions trading scheme, which has afforded a tremendous ability to know who's doing what and with what emissions footprint. Uh, USTR has actually asked the ITC to conduct a report that is due in 2025 to really figure out uh, the carbon emissions intensity, I think, in an average sectoral basis across the U.S. economy. Again, that'll take until 2025. And without that additional data, it's very hard to engage in earnest discussions if part of the end goal is to claim and to incentivize um, uh, greater attributes related to green production. A third major difference is that the United States, of course, has major outstanding questions about the durability of its approach. Uh, presidential candidate Donald Trump has repeatedly said that he would try to undo various features of the IRA. What's interesting is that the European Commission is also increasingly under pressure to roll back some of its green industrial uh, strategies as well. And so we'll have to see 
uh, just how many of these various climate um, policies will stick around and in what form. That being said, the European Commission and the United States have a lot in common. They're both attempting to combat non-market practices from China. Uh, they also have to confront the costs of a greater de-risking agenda. And I know you've thought a lot about risk calculation and where de-risking could be helpful versus harmful. But either way, as the economic security net expands, both will have to confront the costs of retaliation, uh, especially at a time when they're trying to ramp up domestic production of green technologies. This in turn leads to another commonality, which is that the European Union and the United States will need to work very concertedly to build green supply chains and create new marketplaces. And I know that you've also done um, quite a bit of thinking about that. So in our second report that we released in January, what we try to do is lay out a transatlantic framework for strategic cooperation. What can actually be achieved in 2024? I think we can take the critical minerals agreement and GASA off the table for now, just because they did encounter so many immediate obstacles and progress has been quite stalled. Uh, one recommendation, which I think is a little bit uncomfortable for some folks in the energy security side of the debate, is that to date, we've really focused a lot of the climate and trade debate on an emissions-based approach. Uh, again, this has come up in the CBAM, but also in GASA. What that does is essentially leave the others who are responsible for accelerating climate change off the hook. Uh, and so it's putting a lot of burden on large emitters or fossil fuel companies, uh, but there are a host of other companies um, and sectors that are equally responsible for climate change. Uh, the European Union has confronted this already in its EU Deforestation Act. Uh, the US has similarly proposed legislation aimed at combating deforestation. Uh, and so I think that should probably be a workable and very real feature of the transatlantic uh, trade and climate debate um, heading into the, the rest of the year. So the focus on biodiversity and nature-based solutions. Um, I think another interesting feature, and this came up in the uh, US Select Committee report on China calling to reset the relationship, is this idea that you could use something like a rebuttable presumption from the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act in the context of IUU fishing. That's interesting, and I think uh, it is worth exploring where Brussels and Washington could use similar tools to combat, again, deforestation or uh, to promote other nature-based uh, solutions. However, the big elephant in the room, of course, is de-risking, is China. Where does China fit in to this transatlantic approach? What can we do without China? Where is it actually a security imperative that we de-risk? Uh, von der Leyen, of course, the president of the European Commission, coined this term almost this time last year. Uh, and it has since, I think, become a very efficient way of saying that it, it is worth trying to remove geopolitical and climate risk from supply chains in order to effectuate greater security uh, down the road. So I think something that I would like to hear from you is your response uh, to some of the things that I've said so far, but also where you think China fits in. You've done a lot of really excellent and very cutting edge data driven work on Chinese EV overcapacity, where that stands in the European Union, and then in turn what that says about actual risk exposure. Uh, so let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Emily. So first of all, let me say that a Monday that starts with talking to you about climate, transatlantic relationship, security. I mean, it's it's a good it's a good start to the week. Um, so thank you so much for having me, and thank you for your papers, which are really valuable, especially because one really lays out some of the challenges, the differences uh, in approaches between the U.S. and the European Union, uh, and I think you know some of the some of the the unfortunate uh, lack of progress uh, on some issues, including the GASA. Um, and then the other paper actually really provides some really sort of innovative thinking on, and solutions uh, to move forward some of the, the, the discourse, um, if not, you know, action itself. And, uh, you know, I'm going to Berlin uh, this week, so it was very helpful for me to get a bit of a refresher on where the, the relationship stand, stand, uh, stands today. 
Um, so a couple of things uh, in terms of reactions. Um, I think the gas or the GAS is, uh, is really an interesting uh, case study in the challenges that exist in translating what is a strong security partnership between the US and the European Union into something uh, that looks more like a partnership on economic issues, right? Because you have um, the, the, is the, cha the China challenge there, you have the, the threat of tariffs, you have very strong incentives and, and, uh, and threats on both sides that you know, really should have moved forward this, uh, this, um, um, this agreement, especially because I think in, in many ways it encapsulated what the hopes, especially in Brussels, were during the Biden, with the you know, uh, advent of the Biden administration, that it would usher a new era in which you'd have stronger collaboration with uh, partners on these economic security issues, but that would you know, really prioritize climate. We haven't seen a lot of progress, right? As you said, this is not something where you think uh, that there's going to be a, a lot of uh, progress in the near future. And I think that really underlies the, the, the challenge ahead. Uh, and I think, you know, you could, you could take that and, and look at some other issues, which, you know, you really lay out very well in your paper. Um, so I think moving forward, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the leaders are going to have to think of where the, there's an overlap of interests and where there's politically viable ways forward. Now, China is really central to all these discussions uh, for a variety of different reasons. I mean, I think uh, I, I used this line recently, but I'll use it again, uh, that you know, usually people say you can't talk about climate if you're not talking about China because they talk about China as the major emitter. Yes, but I think nowadays you can't talk about climate without talking about China because China is, is such a major producer of all the technologies we need to achieve decarbonization. And so now there's this real big debate about how exactly do you de-risk in the climate uh, sector uh, when you know China is so central to producing these uh, technologies at cost, so that they can actually be competitive and deployed easily. Uh, but you know, of course, diversification is necessary because so many of these uh, technologies are, and these supply chains are so concentrated in China that it does present certain risks, as you just mentioned, the, the graphite uh, issue, right? So I think there's like a real dilemma there, and I think there's a slight difference in approaches, um, in or maybe not so slight, uh, between the. Washington and European capitals. Um, I think in part one of the challenges is that the U.S. has been able to put forward a much, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, um, stronger uh, industrial policy framework with the through the IRA, while the European Union has been, had more challenges in putting forward a fiscal. Uh, response with actual funding um, uh, that, that's sort of a unified approach, right? The Net Zero Industry Act is, this simply does not have the same kind of uh, uh, fiscal muscle power, let's say, that the IRA has. And in fact, that's been one of the challenges between the European Union and, the, and, the, and, the, and Washington because of the uh, concerns that the IRA has treated unfairly some European companies and cut um, and, and attracted also investment outside of Europe. Um, so I think in that sense, the European Union is, is much more dependent on foreign direct investment. And so foreign direct investment from China is not seen as negatively. I think that's a, a crucial difference. Um, I think if you talk to people in, in Brussels, they'll say, well, um, or at least you know, I have some people, uh, that if, if, the, if the result of the probe in, on EVs, right, the, the anti-subsidy investigation that's ongoing on, on Chinese EVs, um, if the result of that is that the more Chinese companies invest in Europe, that's okay. That's not a bad result because more European workers will be employed. Um, they will be facing so many of the similar costs as European automakers, and it helps sort of prevent the deindustrialization in Europe, which is a really big concern. I think in Washington, that's sort of uh, not the kind of view you usually get, even though there has been, I think, um, you know, I think there's still an ongoing debate about exactly what kind of risks companies like Goshan, which is a battery maker in Michigan, actually pose to national security. So I think there's this ongoing uh, rethinking about, you know, as the risking progresses, uh, and we start seeing, you know, the, the effects of it on the ground and we start seeing Chinese companies reacting to these, uh, 
to these de-risking uh, regulation and trying to comply with them in many cases, um, I think then you start seeing different reactions on both sides of the Atlantic. And I think that China, the reason I bring this up is because when you're looking for things that can unite Washington and Brussels, China sometimes, if you think here in Washington, is seen as a uniting sort of threat. But I think that threat is perceived a little bit differently uh, in Brussels. And I think that gets to the point of what you were mentioning before, that I think we need to think uh, more carefully about what risks are we trying to de-risk from, how do we define them, and what the right solutions are to them. But you know, going back to your, uh, your excellent papers, I didn't want to get too far from them, um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about how you see potential solutions moving forward. I think, you know, for example, your um, uh, suggestions to focus more on uh, not just um, emission targets is really important, really powerful. I think there's actually a double win there potentially for um, uh, security as well is if we think about resources that are potential uh, choke points, a lot of those resources are also ones that perhaps we want to, um, that can be really impactful when we're mining and uh, um, refining, right? So maybe thinking more carefully about whether there's recycling options, there's other technologies that maybe can be less uh, environmentally impactful, they might be have also uh, national security implications. Um, so I thinking about some of those uh, um, uh, potential solutions, but especially, I think, very interestingly, you, you propose, you know, bolstering the WTO. That's not something that many people in Washington are talking about right now. But if you can think, talk a little more about that, I think that'd be really interesting. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks for that. Um, let me go back to one thing that you were saying earlier about identification of risk. And this is actually really interesting because I spend a lot of time talking to G7 governments who pretty much unanimously agree on one thing, which is, yeah, let's figure out a viable pathway forward to build more secure supply chains. But then the next question is, OK, so which supply chains and how do you go about sufficiently achieving granularity when it comes to supply chains. And one thing that we propose in this paper is called the data mapping for green risk. And there are a host of these new AI tools that essentially can show uh, countries and companies alike what their risk profile looks like. So for example, uh, there's a startup in London that can look at an economy's entire exposure to graphite restrictions. So let's take Italy as an example because they're the G7 president this year. You can essentially put graphite in as one commodity and run uh, a program to see the entire Italian economy's vulnerability if China were to cut off all of its graphite supply. And that's really helpful. I think some of these tools um, maybe are oversold. Some of them only go to the HTS four digit code level, which is really broad. Uh, but either way, it provides a real time map of where vulnerabilities are. And if you actually have a vulnerability, I think what tends to get lost in the discussion, as you very aptly point out in a lot of your work, is that not everything is related to national security. We can have a secure economy. And so we really do need to do a good job of finding out where we're most vulnerable and then pooling joint resources to either scale up responsible mining and processing uh, in a way that does not degrade uh, ecosystems or to figure out how to use less at the end of the day. And so I think we're really at the forefront of overlapping, overlaying some of these AI tools uh, for climate change driven outcomes, especially when it comes to supply chain security. I was actually working on a transatlantic AI project uh, several years ago before the pandemic. And I talked to this AI researcher who claimed that AI would do all of these things for climate, but at the time, that wasn't really true. We didn't know what some of the applications are. So I'm actually really excited. We're finally at this new frontier of where economics, trade, and climate all come together, and we can actually get the real-time data. So I think that's exciting. On your second question about the WTO, I am generally a little skeptical about putting all of our eggs in the WTO basket, which I think is less an indictment of the WTO and more a reflection of where things stand today. However, we don't really have time to start a new institution. And I think even if you were to start a new trade tool based uh, system called a climate club or some other plurilateral format, 
we don't have time to establish all of the new rules. And the WTO actually has a ton of committees that are very well suited to carry out a lot of this work. So for example, the Technical Barriers to Trade, the TBT committee, could absolutely put out additional guidance on how to measure carbon intensity of traded goods, or um, I think the WTO is very well suited to engage in some concerted discussions regarding subsidy reform. We don't quite have the system that we do for agriculture, where we have a traffic light system, as it's called, where you have the green light, which is permitted subsidies, you have the red light, which is not permitted, and then some uh, yellow light in the middle where, under certain circumstances, uh, they may be permitted. A group of scholars actually recently, under the Villar framework, put out, uh, I think, a very ambitious vision for how to apply this traffic light system to subsidies. And the idea here is that we should probably be a little bit more flexible with green subsidies. Uh, I was saying to, to an audience recently that this is the time, take out a double mortgage, right? <laughs> we need to spend big on climate because we need emissions reductions yesterday. Uh, and so by uh, institutionalizing some of these subsidy reform discussions, that could actually encourage over time um, countries to spend more in a meaningful way under the understanding that said subsidies will not be overly distortive. And I think that invites a series of other questions about the ability of uh, developing economies to partake when they don't have sufficient fiscal space to make the same types of investments. And that's certainly come up a lot, uh, not only in the IRA context, but also in the carbon border adjustment mechanism context. So there are a lot of moving parts, but we have a multilateral institution uh, with almost 200 members. And if we can get together in some sort of group formation where we can get meaningful um, progress through this architecture, I think that actually could lay a very good foundation because as soon as we shift to these smaller uh, external plurilateral arrangements, again, they, they need a new foundation. Uh, we would have to negotiate uh, membership and accession rules. Uh, is China or India permitted? Uh, if they can't get into said climate club, does that mean that we're not making sufficient progress? Uh, don't we all need to be negotiating? And is that politically viable? And so I'm sort of on team WTO when it comes to uh, climate and trade issues. And I think that's a really good opportunity to reinfuse uh, that organization. And I will note, of course, that the 13th ministerial conference is occurring right now in Abu Dhabi. And the director general of the WTO has herself been very, very interested in elevating climate as one of the key topics of today's um, WTO. And so that's very exciting to see. But I would love to go back to uh, a couple of things that you said about EVs. And I know that you recently testified in Congress on some of these questions as well. But there seem to be a couple of sides of the debate. One is that we need to de-risk from China on clean tech because they could cut off our supply. So I'm wondering if you think that that's really a viable outcome. I think in certain other areas like semiconductors or high tech where we're in this tech race, that makes more sense that the fears are better founded about potential cutoffs or retaliatory measures. On the green transition, however, it's clearly in both countries' interests to pursue deeper decarbonization jointly and on an accelerated time frame. So that to me calls into question a little bit of the underlying assumption that China could wake up one day and cut off all solar exports to the United States. Uh, that's question one. Question two is on EVs, and there seems to be a little bit of confusion about what has led to this glut or overproduction of electric vehicles. And I'm curious if you have thoughts on whether that's attributable primarily to waning domestic demand and a Chinese economic downturn, or whether or not they have a very competitive EV sector. Uh, they have far, far more uh, vehicle companies than we do here in the United States. And that's actually had the net effect of driving costs down and creating a more uh, vibrant marketplace. And so I'm wondering if there's some market forces that actually account for this overcapacity problem, or if it really is a state-driven policy that merits a transatlantic joint retaliatory tariff type of mechanism. Yeah. Um well, let me start from that, actually, right? And I think the answer is yes. So you, you do see, I mean, these are, this, this is an industry that has received significant support from the state over you know, the past decade and a half. 
uh, and it has, uh, it, it is, you know, the way it is because China has a specific type of political economy uh, where often uh, um, industrial policy is also conducted at the local level. So it tends to be, uh, there tends to be a lot of competition actually between different cities and provinces. So you tend to have sort of a, not necessarily a very coordinated uh, effort in industrial policy. And that works very well at creating a ton of companies that produce a ton of products, right? And that's sort of, that's, that's sort of at the heart of a lot of the overcapacity issues that China has had over the, the decades. Um, but in the case of EVs, I actually think it's kind of interesting because we take the overcapacity term from um, uh, commodities like steel Steel, right? That's usually what, what it used to be applied to, right? Where essentially Chinese steel comes and it sort of displaces steel that's equivalent in one way or another from, from a different uh, uh, location, right? And you, you, you look at steel, you probably can't tell with like, you know, just by looking at it, what the difference is. I'm, you know, obviously there's, there's differences, but more or less it's a commodity, right? Solar panels, very similar kind of issue, right? They're real commodities. Um, one solar panel is not necessarily all that different from the other. Cars, I mean, you and I, I know, are not car people in the sense that we don't obsess about our cars. I don't own a car, actually, which is kind of an irony. But people really care about their cars, right? So a brand or a model can make a huge difference. So it's kind of interesting that we're now seeing this discourse of overcapacity coming from China because there is a bit of a question, I think, about is that overcapacity or is it just that they're displacing these other vehicles elsewhere because the consumer prefer them? Um, and I think there's a bit of a, you know, both because they are coming in at a very low price point. And that's the result of, yes, industrial policy, but also a brutal competition within China. We're seeing this uh, price war that's been going on now for, for quite some time in, within China. And Tesla is actually part of that. Uh, so I think there's some interesting discussion to be had about, you know, exactly uh, who, which uh, players are producing in China and what, what, what the role they have. And what's happening is that uh, Chinese manufacturers have lower and lower margins within China. It's increasingly competitive. Uh, the market in, you know, the, the, the economy in China is not doing so well. So even though actually sales are pretty decent and uh, now 35% uh, of, of all new auto sales are EVs in China, I think that's the latest data for 2023. That's remarkable. I think we're struggling to get to 8% in the US, right? Uh, Germany is maybe at 18%. I think that's about uh, more or less um, ballpark numbers there, uh, just to give you a sense. So sales are pretty, you know, they're decent in China, but you know, it's, it's a difficult economy right now. And so automakers are increasingly looking abroad where demand is surging uh, globally, not just Europe, but also in middle income countries like Mexico or Thailand. Um, consumers are looking for EVs and lo and behold, these Chinese automakers can make really cheap EVs uh, that uh, um, are pretty decent, right? And so I think you get this combination of industrial policy factors, market factors, push and pull factors, and all of a sudden these companies are internationalizing like never before. So they're, the exports are surging, uh, but also um, com Chinese companies are starting to open factories all over the world. Um, you, uh, you know, BYD and I just to uh, promote myself, but uh, you know, I'm publishing a, a report very soon where I have the, you know, the, the interactive map of where BYD is opening factories. They are now building or have factories for passenger EVs um, uh, you know, in Asia, Europe, uh, South America, and uh, you know, it's reportedly looking into Mexico, so North America as well. All right, uh, and they're not the only company doing this. Of course, they're the biggest EV manufacturers, so they're at the forefront of this. But you see this trend where Chinese automakers are, are looking abroad. And I think that has big implications for the Global South, uh, because in many cases, it is Global South customers that are buying these cars. And it is uh, countries in the Global South where these car companies are looking to build factories. So you look at a country like Thailand, they're doing really well in terms of attracting all this investment. Um, and I think that's something that we should think about in Washington, because obviously, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, uh, the fight for the Global South. And, you know, when you open a factory and provide jobs in a sort of, uh, you know, high value added industry that is also happens to be sort of next generation technology um, in, the, in the green industry, that's actually quite attractive. Um, so I think that's something to, to, to keep in mind. Um, and, 
you know, I think that ties into the broader debate of, you know, what is the advantage and, and the national security risk of China be so, being so involved in these industries? And it's quite complicated. On the one hand, I like to point out to people, you buy a solar panel, you install it, it's good for 30, 40 years. You can probably plan when you're going to replace it. And when you replace it, if there's no Chinese solar panels available, you can, you know, you can go back to coal if you want to, right? You can do whatever you want. It's electricity, essentially. Now, um, I do think there is a broader economic issue and concern, right? Especially when it comes to not necessarily solar, which at this point is, is all made in China. I think there's a broader issue there about human rights um, and, and potentially maybe uh, not necessarily national security, but economic um, resilience, right? Like we saw with, with COVID, right? When, when, when the ports were shut down that nobody could buy a solar panel for a bit. Uh, so that's, but I mean, I think for some other industries, especially automotive industry, this employs a lot of people in the US, in Europe. And I think that's why EVs are, are becoming such a flashpoint. It's because this is an industry to protect. And our industries, uh, the, the legacy industries and legacy automakers in the US and Europe have really struggled to adapt and adapt early to this new technology and, and, and embrace electrification. And so now they're in a process of catching up and they're catching up quite slowly. And so I think now there's this real debate of, well, do you protect the market? How much do you protect it? And how do you ensure that your automakers are still investing uh, in these new technologies in ways where you know you can expect them to become competitive. And so I think there's that economic issue. But I think the national security, you know, I, I think it's it's nuanced, right? I think there are actually more risks when it comes to the cyber side of things, right? And uh, Secretary Raimondo talked about potentially the data risks associated with Chinese EVs. I think uh, hacking is going to be a really big issue. And that's not necessarily a China issue, but I think that's something we should be thinking about. When it comes to the actual hardware, I mean, I don't know. I think there's probably bigger risks elsewhere. Yeah, I'm glad that you brought up the data security issue. I was recently in a European capital and got into this lengthy debate with someone who thought that Chinese solar panels were an existential risk because essentially they connect the internet and the Chinese government could shut down your solar panels, thereby effectively reducing your electricity supply overnight. Uh, I think that line of thinking also tends to think, well, if everyone's driving a Chinese EV, then um, the government or a, a company at the behest of the government could shut down EVs automatically. Um, so you're driving down the highway and your car shuts down. Uh, however, it's very possible to get a software update. Uh, I know people with Teslas, I am not one of them. My car is very old, uh, recycled <laughs> and uh, upcycled. Um, but with a Tesla, you don't need to do anything. You don't need to take your car in for an update, right? You can do everything through an app in your phone. And so if there were to be some sort of infection or problem with the, the infrastructure in your car that you could update it remotely. Um, so I think it's kind of interesting that there's this confluence of tech, data security, cybersecurity issues, and also the need to have a green transition on an accelerated time frame. And so it's not clear that especially the Transatlantic Alliance is really ready to confront some of these issues. And I think that also speaks to a broader inability of people to really understand the physical nature of the technology. You know, is a car uh, hoovering up all of this data? Where is it being stored? I think we're already under a lot of pressure uh, in terms of maxing out the available compute. And so it seems a little bit unrealistic on one hand to think, well, of course, we're just keeping all of this data in perpetuity. Um, so I look forward to seeing others' analysis on that in the near future because there's so many good questions that, of course, have major policy uh, implications. So um, let me turn back to you for a second. I know you've recently written a piece about uh, Special Climate Envoy John Kerry announcing uh, his retirement. I think he'll go join the re-election campaign and in his place, John Podesta will be taking over. Uh, it's my understanding that Kerry and his Chinese counterpart had a very close working relationship. So I'm curious if you think that this will have any broader downstream effects and the ability of China and the United States to cooperate. Are we kind of setting reset? Are we picking up where John Kerry left off? Uh, what are the prospects for cooperation? Yeah, I mean, I think, yes. I mean, I think the, the John, John Kerry and Xi Jinping stepping down, is, you know, is is potentially 
you know, it's hard to imagine another duo that has such a long standing personal relationship, right? And, and such an, a wealth of experience when it comes to climate diplomacy on both sides, there, there really was a uh, significant, um, uh, you know, background there. And in fact, they, they were both sort of put in that position because of that, right? And they were given similar titles um, to sort of be able to, to, to speak to each other. So I think, you know, that is going to be, you know, that personal uh, relationship certainly counted for something. And so that's going to certainly be a challenge for John Podesta. Um, I do think there are some structural issues that are just hard to, they were hard to overcome for Kerry uh, and, and Xi Jinping, right? I think, you know, traditionally there was a lot of cooperation in the sort of clean tech space between the U.S. and China. And that's just been completely taken off the table uh, today because of all the security concerns and uh, the tech competition and the de-risking and all these other issues, right? Um, and so I think there's just been a, a, a the, I think the past few years under the Biden administration, there's been sort of a slow effort to find what areas the two countries can cooperate on and what climate cooperation looks like in an era sort of a strategic competition. Uh, and I think that's been a challenge. So I think you see that in the Sunnyland statement uh, that, that, that came out last um, November, where um, the, the, you know, they, they tried to find areas where both countries could make progress sort of in parallel rather than cooperating directly. Uh, there's also efforts to restart these working groups that I, I certainly hope will move forward because I actually think that the most productive area for cooperation would probably be global governance or so sort of agreeing on the uh, the rules of the the road, right? I think similar to what you know, to reconnecting to what we were talking about earlier, where you need uh, uh, maybe the WTO reform, you need sort of some sort of shared framework. And I think actually there might be space for the European Union to work within that, given it's uh, you know the, that the European Union has been. Uh, has had traditionally much stronger relations with China on climate and when it comes to sort of governance issues, right? Um, so we'll see how that, that goes. There was some interesting uh, language about both countries investing separately in carbon capture um, investments. I think that might be a model for certain types of clean tech. Uh, but I think more broadly, when it comes to cooperation, I think you do need uh, these people from you know, top leaders, but also technical experts from the U.S. and China to sit in the same room and sort of come to some agreements on certain standards. I think there's a lot of areas where you could have non-controversial cooperation, uh, right? I think uh, adaptation is going to be a really big challenge in the global south. I think coming up with rules, uh, you know, reliable rules on climate finance, ESG, right? These could all be really powerful uh, areas where we could make a lot of progress. But it's it's hard to imagine this environment. And I think it would be even harder to imagine under a Trump uh, administration. Where, and I would love to hear your thoughts on where you think the transatlantic relationship might be headed, um, you know, based on, on the outcomes of the November election, but also the elections in Europe. It's a great question and one that I got uh, very frequently during my recent tour uh, in Europe. And I think there's a certain sentiment, especially at the European Commission level of trying to uh, bolster cooperation where possible. Uh, the EU-US Trade and Technology Council recently convened here in Washington the last week of January, and they're set to reconvene in Belgium in early April. And this is really a good opportunity for the parties to demonstrate that regardless of the election outcome, since Europe's also heading into historic elections, uh, the, that they can produce something very durable. I think for very good reasons, the TTC hasn't quite been able to deliver anything on a very granular level, aside from this EG, EV charging station language that hopefully will create a new standard for having similar EV charging stations on both sides of the Atlantic. But what's happened in the TTC has been that geopolitical forces on the outside have intervened and really slowed down more affirmative climate progress. And I think that's a recurring problem where it's very convenient to regard climate change as this behemoth problem facing the global community. 
but that there are very urgent crises, whether it's related to Gaza or ongoing um, problems in eastern Ukraine. Those are urgent. They do need a resolution today. But at the same time, that shouldn't come at the expense of a more affirmative agenda. And so I think both parties are very invested in trying to, to cooperate moving forward. That being said, uh, there are concerted efforts to roll back various features of the IRA. And I fear um, from a climate motivated person that, that the European Union may look back and um, regret having uh, been so concerned about the EV tax credit. We really haven't seen so far that giant sucking sound of jobs out of the EU to build uh, additional EVs. Here, I think the IRA rollout has been uh, a little slower than anticipated. And if the future is a politically precarious one that could see some of that legislative language undone, that really does call into question the overall credibility of the United States in using trade and economic tools to advance the climate agenda. So I think it's in everyone's best interest to sort of take stock of where we are and then figure out how to safeguard um, uh, progress that we have made. And it would be a great opportunity again in April to have concrete outcomes, whether it's on the adoption of carbon accounting technologies or uh, even cooperation on a potential EV investigation. I think we need to be on the same page. And this does, of course, present a geopolitical problem, which is if we have the appearance of creating one block, whether it's green or not green, <laughs> one block to confront China, doesn't that increase tensions? And I think inevitably, yes, to a degree. But the other option right now is that we continue to be disorganized as an alliance, whether it's on CHIPS Act funding, um, or green industrial strategies. And really, it's time to seize the moment and create a transatlantic marketplace that makes us stronger as an economic competitor in the global marketplace. And so I'm optimistic that heading into the elections and then beyond the elections, we'll be able to see uh, concerted progress. And just to advertise one more time, you can find all of our thoughts in our policy briefs online, because I think jointly we do actually put a lot of concrete thought into um, what we can do with 2024 and beyond. So I encourage everyone um, to read those online. And with that, let me invite you to make any closing comments uh, that you would like, and then we will conclude this event. Um, yes, well, thank you, Emily. Uh, and I would really encourage everybody to look at Emily's uh, briefs on, on these topics. There's two of them. They're both short, but really informative. I found them really helpful. Um, and actually, one of the things that you mentioned in the briefs, and I, I just wanted to sort of conclude thinking about that, was uh, calling for more interoperability uh, between the sort of frameworks and approaches in the U.S. and the EU. And I, I would wholeheartedly agree with that. And I think it's important, actually, even when thinking about pathways for some level of um, you know, engagement on climate uh, between the U.S. and China, it would be good for the U.S. to be starting from a place where it knows where it stands in terms of regulation, governance, uh, have clear ideas on, on what it actually wants to see and envision on a global uh, and, you know, within the transatlantic relationship on climate. And so I think having stronger uh, engagement with partners to start with and sort of clarify, um, you know, accounting systems, as you said, and frameworks and thinking about interoperability is then a very good way of then thinking how, you know, a, a starting point to then potentially expand and try and bring into that system um, other countries, including potentially China, when we're talking about climate. Uh, for example, which is going to be important. I think it's going to be especially important to continue to think about these issues because Chinese companies are internationalizing very rapidly uh, in the climate space. And the, the, these are going to continue to be really important industries for China. And these companies are internationalizing no matter what, right? So I think it really poses this challenge for the EU and the US of thinking about how they can address this and also think of what frameworks they can provide for these companies to operate within, right? So either you think about it now, or at some point you're going to have to admit that these companies are there no matter what, right? And so I think there, there's no way of shutting them out completely, but maybe thinking about what the standards are, what the, the type of transparency we would like, uh, and how to, um, you know, how to think about their, the FDI would be very important. 
Yeah, well, thank you so much for your thoughts. Uh, once again, I recommend reading Ilaria's work online, and that concludes today's program.